Let's talk a little bit then about the other targeted agent that was approved at virtually the same time as, as Everlima Sunitinib. Uh, so there, there's an interesting story uh, behind that as well. Uh, I think the initial thoughts there is that uh, these tumors are very vascular, and so angiogenesis inhibitors might have an activity in, in, in uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Um, that was one of the initial reasons sunitinib was tested. And in fact, in a phase two, there was some activity that was seen uh, in terms of both response and stabilization. Uh, that then led to a, a larger registration study. Um, Diane, you want to tell us a little bit about the registration study and what right, that absolutely. showed? So um, as you said, based on your phase two study, um, with very promising benefits in the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors as opposed to carcinoid, the re registration phase three trial was initiated. Uh, it was given at a dose of 37 and a half milligrams because of the toxicities that you had seen with the 50 milligram dose. Uh, and in fact, the toxicities were much um, less in the phase three trial as compared to the phase two. Uh, and this study had a planned 340 patients that were supposed to be enrolled. It was stopped early based on the decision of the Data Safety Monitoring Board. Uh, but interestingly, um, the results were um, certainly um, exciting in that the uh, sunitinib arm had a time to uh, progression-free survival um, of 11.4 11 11 months as compared to five and a half months in the placebo arm. Again, um, interestingly, uh, almost identical to the Radiant 3, which is ever <coughs> Um So this led to two uh, public in, in the New England Journal of Medicine, two publications of pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor agents that have both eventually led to their FDA approval. So it was sort of for the first time, I think, it, it, very exciting time. Um, one, because obviously we had agents for our patients that we really hadn't had in 30 years. Um, but two, it also proved that for the, we, we can run rigorous, um, well-designed clinical trials for our uncommon disease. So um, it, they were pivotal studies for, for multiple levels, but certainly um, now we have these two agents. You had mentioned some of the side effects with Everolimus. What do you tend to see when you use sunitinib in these patients? Right, so the hypertension seems to be an issue. Um, I, with the 37 and a half milligrams, it's typically um, something that we can control with one, sometimes two antihypertensive uh, medications. The hand foot syndrome can be typical, um, as well as diarrhea, and sometimes a lowering of the blood counts as well. John, your experience with uh, sunitinib, have you seen side effects in this patient population? Um, yeah, I think Diane mentioned the main ones. Nausea and diarrhea is another um, side effect that we sometimes see. You know, uh, trying to choose between Everolimus and Sunitinib is quite difficult. Uh, as has been pointed out, the Kaplan-Meier curves for PFS are virtually superimposable. Uh, the side effect profile is different, but um, you ask, uh, you know, 10 different specialists and they'll split pretty much evenly down the middle as to whether they think Sunitinib or Everolimus is more tolerable. And uh, I, I'm really not sure myself. So it's, uh, it's a little bit challenging. Sometimes patient comorbidities make it a little bit easier to choose. So if a patient has underlying diabetes, it's easy to you know, select sunitinib. If a patient has underlying significant hypertension, uh, I'm more likely to choose Everolimus. But otherwise, it can be quite challenging to choose among the two. Diane had mentioned that the, uh, the dosing schedule is a little bit different in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, 37 and a half daily continuous. Do uh, you have experience with that schedule, and, and how often do you find you need to dose reduce? I do think the schedule is more tolerable than the 50 milligrams, four weeks on, two weeks off. I still need to reduce, um, I'd say, in about 30% of patients to 25 milligrams. I think that's fair. What about Everolimus? The dose there is 10 milligrams continuous. Uh, do you find you need to dose reduce that at times? Probably in a slightly larger percentage of patients, um, maybe 40 percent. Some, some patients run into trouble very early with um, uh, mouth pain, oral mucositis. Um, some patients, it's sort of a slow progression of side effects like fatigue, weight loss, malaise, uh, especially in the elderly. And uh, in those cases, I'll typically go down to uh, 5 milligrams. There's also intermediate dose, a 7.5 milligram dose. Uh, which is a reasonable first step dose reduction.